So <laughs> just give me a smile. No, that's a proper smile. Yeah. <laughs> you do. Okay, who are we? Okay, yeah. Let's go up on the top again. All right, who are we? Who are we? Who are we? We are Holy Spirit empowered servants like, like Jesus. Jesus. We are we are we are the hospitable family of Jesus. Hi, sorry to interrupt this amazing bumper, but you just heard that we are the hospitable family of Jesus. Well, what do families do? Families hang out. Families eat together. Families are in each other's spaces. Okay, maybe not spaces right now, but definitely in each other's faces. Now, if you just attend City Gates online and you're not a part of our community groups, I want to say to you, you have not experienced our family yet. And that's who we are. That's how we live out this value is by meeting together in smaller groups. In many ways, coming together on a Sunday is just our, a, a group of smaller groups. And so I want to encourage you to get into a community group. That is where uh, life happens for us as a church. And we don't want you to miss out. And so uh, I'm going to let the rest of this uh, bumper video roll now. Um, but I'd love for you to sign up for a community group if you are not in one already. Bye. We are. We are. Strategic. Missionaries. For Jesus. We are. Disciples. Devoted to Jesus. We are. Helping people. Find. And follow. Jesus. We, we are. are. We, we are. are City, City Gates. Gates. We are City Gates. Oh my gosh, are you, you like nailed it. it. Memory kicked in. <laughs>
Strength and beauty are in his sanctuary. Ascribe to the Lord, O families of the peoples, ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. Bring an offering and come into his courts. Worship the Lord in the splendor of holiness. Tremble before him, all the earth. Say among the nations, the Lord reigns. Yes, the world is established. It shall never be moved. He will judge the peoples with equity. Let the heavens be glad and let the earth rejoice. Let the sea roar and all that fills it. Let the field exult and everything in it. Then shall all the trees of the forest sing for joy before the Lord. For he comes, for he comes to judge the earth. He will judge the world in righteousness and the peoples in his faithfulness.
been so so kind to me. All the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God. Oh, it chases me down, fights till I'm found, leaves the ninety-nine. I couldn't earn it. I don't deserve. It's your fault, steal your love far from me. Mm-hmm. You've been so, so good to me. Coming after me There's no shadow you won't light up Nothing you won't climb up Coming after me There's no wall you won't kick down Lie you won't tear down Coming after me Hey City Gates, Corey here, uh, and I have the privilege of leading us through our time of confession this week. We've been reading a lot about uh, inheritance and adoption into God's family, and 1 Peter mentions that we were ransomed from the futile ways inherited from our forefathers. And so this week I just want to pray through those futile ways, those patterns that have actually been inherited from our culture, family upbringing, you know, you name it. Um, Because I think oftentimes that those those sins, those patterns can hide because they're either tolerated or even accepted. And so I just want to name a few even. Let's pray through things like ambition, that is selfish, pornography, love of money, uh, wasted time in the form of scrolling through social media or just seeking identity in anything like politics or career or country, just anything that is not Jesus. And so I just want to lead us through this prayer together. The words will be up on the screen. Um, but let's, let's pray this all together. We confess, our Father, that we do not live up to the family name. We are more ready to resent than to forgive. 
more ready to manipulate than to serve, more ready to fear than to love, more ready to keep our distance than to welcome, more ready to compete than to help. Forgive us. Show us what it cost you to give up your son, that we might become your sons and daughters and receive your inheritance. So this inheritance that the world has to offer us, it does not have to be ours. In fact, God's inheritance has been purchased for us by Jesus Christ. And so I want to lead us in, in now a, a prayer, right? We've, we've confessed and I just want us to turn and praise. And I want us to remember that this idea of inheritance is not a new idea that came along with Peter or even Jesus, but this has been a through line throughout the, the, the whole time um, in the Old Testament uh, to the New Testament. And so we're actually going to use a passage from Micah to, to pray through and, and give thanks to God. And I just want us to remember that this passage and prayer is as true for us now as it was for the Israelites all those years ago. So please, the words will be up on the screen, but let's give thanks to God with this passage here. Who is a God like you who pardons sin and forgives the transgression of the remnant of his inheritance. You do not stay angry forever, but delight to show mercy. You will again have compassion on us. You will tread our sins underfoot and hurl all our iniquities into the depths of the sea. Thank you, God, for being faithful to forgive. stood before creation eternity in your hand you spoke the earth into motion my soul now to stand you stood before
everyone. My name is Vic and I'm going to be speaking today. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, we are in the middle of a, of a series out of uh, the letters that Peter, who is an apostle, a disciple of Jesus, wrote to a bunch of churches uh, in what is today called as, um, known as modern-day Turkey. Uh, and uh, we are in chapter 2, and we're going to read about seven verses. Uh, some of these verses we did read last week, um, but we're going to just look at them again and, and find some new truth in there. Um, and so if you have your Bibles with you, do open up to 1 Peter chapter 2. Otherwise, of course, you can follow along with me on screen. Uh, verses 4 to 10 reads like this. As you come to him, a living stone rejected by men, but in the sight of God chosen and precious. You yourselves, like living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For it stands in Scripture, Behold, I am laying in Zion a stone, a cornerstone, chosen and precious, and whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. So the honor is for you who believe, but for those who do not believe, the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone and a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. They stumble because they disobey the word as they were destined to do. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. This is God's word. Why don't you join me as I quickly pray. Thank you, Father, for these words. Would you help us today to receive them, open our ears to hear, open our hearts to receive. And would these words mold us and shape us, and transform us more into the image and likeness of your son, Jesus. We need you, Holy Spirit, to do that now. And we ask all of these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Uh, if there's a title to today's ser uh, sermon, it is Stand or Stumble. Are you standing or are you stumbling? And verse 4 here uh, starts off by uh, saying, As you come to Him, as, as you come to Jesus, uh, this living stone. Um, and so today is a come to Jesus a sermon. It's a come to Jesus moment, I trust, for many of us, as most weeks should be as we open up the Bible and we speak about Jesus and the gospel. Uh, but I believe today God's going to speak to uh, many of us in a profound way. Uh, and, and He's going to do that by, uh, by highlighting four stories, four narratives that you may or may not be a part of. Perhaps you are exploring the claims and the teachings of Jesus, uh, and you, you have a life story too, but God wants to intersect with your life and he would love for your story to to form a part of his story and so uh you know the first story we're going to look at the first narrative here is peter's story his life and uh, as we we started uh, a reading here this is peter who wrote this letter um you would have noticed the word stone come up a few times you know living stone living stones the cornerstone he talked about a rock of a fence, you know, and he's quoting Old Testament uh, scriptures uh, here as well, you know, Psalm 118 and Isaiah chapter 28 and chapter 8. And, uh, and, and this word stone is actually very close to, to Peter's heart, you know. Uh, Peter started off uh, as, a, as an unstable fisherman that Jesus had called to follow him. And Jesus turned this unstable fisherman into a stable disciple of Jesus. And, uh, you know, there was even a moment in Peter's life where Jesus renamed him. You know, he said, you know, your name's Petros, you know, which means stone or pebble. And he said, you're going to be called Cephas, you know, which, which means rock. So from sort of stone to rock. And he went from unstable to stable. Like Peter is a guy who, um, who actually had these zero to 100 moments, you know, zero miles per hour to 100 miles per hour, right back to zero again, over and over in his walk with Jesus. As you read the Gospels, you probably would discover that for yourself, you know, um, a fiery guy. Um, but he made some mistakes, of course. And, and Jesus renamed him saying like, I know you're a zero to a hundred guy, but I'm going to make you a steady, steady one. You're going to be a rock upon which I, I can build. And Jesus even prayed for him in Luke chapter 22. It records that for us. He said, Peter, I prayed for you that, 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 uh, that, that you would be, would be strong. Um, and that, that when you return, 
that you would strengthen your brother. So he's saying when you come back from those zero mile per hour moments, you know, and he had a really low one towards the end of his, of, of, uh, of his journey with Jesus uh, when, when Jesus was uh, walking the earth. Uh, he denied him. And, uh, and, and Jesus said, when you come back, he's like, I know you're going to have a zero moment again. But when you, when, you, when you stand up again, would you strengthen your brothers and your sisters? And, and this letter is an answer to that prayer in many ways. He is writing to, to followers of Jesus. He's strengthening you and me as we read these, uh, these words together. Um, and uh, and, and, he's, and he, had, he did turn into this rock, this pillar uh, that Jesus used to build his church. And you might think, listen, that's Peter. I mean, he was one of the disciples. He was actually one of the three, not just the 12, but the three that were close to Jesus. Peter, James, and John. And so, of course, he's going to you know, be a mover and shaker. He's going to be a rock. But Peter is writing, and he's writing to his readers. He's writing to you and me, saying, uh, using the same stone picture for us. Uh, and you know, it's amazing. Peter preached uh, in Acts uh, chapter 4, one of his first few sermons. He preached together with John after they healed someone in the name of Jesus. And they were called in front of the re- religious rulers. And, and they were like, who are you guys? And, and he he quoted actually from this, uh, the, 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 he quoted the same verses here about Jesus being the cornerstone. But before that, he said, I'm just a man like you and me. And actually they noticed, yeah, you're just a man. But the difference here is you had been with Jesus. And that is our story too. Peter's story can be our story too. We are just humans uh, that if we hang out with Jesus, as you come to him, it says, as you come to Jesus, the living stone, you too become living stones. You and I can also become dependable. We can become bricks in a wall of the temple that Jesus is building, the church that he is building. He can build with you and me the same way that he built with Peter. His story can become our story. So that's the first narrative that I trust you would be a part of. But it leads to the second story, the story of the temple, the story of the the, the temple, the building, uh, that they were familiar with in their, their day. And Peter is saying, as he's writing this, that yes, Solomon in the Old Testament built a fantastic temple. But he's basically saying Jesus is greater than Solomon. Je- Solomon was a good builder, but Jesus is a better builder. He is also saying that actually Solomon built an amazing temple, but Jesus is building an even greater temple. And it's interesting because the Old Testament you know, prophesied about you know, Israel's rejection, actually, of, of the Messiah, of the living stone, uh, even in these verses that Peter is quoting. And, and it also predicted the destruction of the physical temple. You know, it was destroyed once and, 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 and rebuilt and then destroyed again in, in 70 AD. And, uh, and it's amazing that Jesus himself, too, uh, quoted from Psalm 118 about the rejection of the cornerstone, in, in Matthew 21, when he was speaking uh, of the, the, the um, listeners at that stage, the, the, the Jewish leaders, religious leaders of the day, he talked about their rejection of him. You know, he, he quoted the same verse. And so we knew that, the, you know, they would reject the Messiah, that, that the temple would be destroyed, which ultimately it was. Um, but then also Jesus spoke of an even better temple. Although that would be destroyed, uh, and 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 he referred to himself, you know, when he spoke to some of the leaders about the temple, he was in the temple. He says, "You could break this place down, but uh, in three days, I will. It will be rebuilt." And he was referring to himself being the temple. The temple was the way you would meet with God. He was saying, "I'm the the new temple. If you want to meet with God, you come to me and come through me." He was referring to his death on the cross and his resurre- uh, resurrection three days later. He being rebuilt. Okay, so and then later on in the New Testament, we see that metaphor moving to you and me. You and I now are temples of the Holy Spirit. You and I, even as we read in in, in 1 Peter chapter 2 here, are living stones being built. Uh, uh, God uses using us to, to build a holy temple, a new temple. And it's a it's it's a, a, a new and a better temple that he's building. And, you know, and as I thought of that, I, I, I realized even in, in the way that we are gathering right now, you and, you and I, you're watching me on screen, uh, we have to really contend for this reality, for this truth. Uh, because right now it is difficult and different to be together as, as the temple. I'm not talking about going to a building. I'm talking about us being together. 
it's difficult. There's some restrictions right now that we, we know we have to adhere to. Physical distancing, masks, stay in your home, etc. So it's difficult, but it's also different that the ways that we do gather through a video camera right now, on screen, on Zoom, that is different and it's difficult, but it is still worth it. It's still worth doing. It should still be done. People love to say this. They love to say, oh, the church is not a building. You know, the church is, is a people. But those very people who often say that are the ones who live in splendid isolation of the people that they refer to being the temple, being the building. Um, and I was thinking about, you know, pieces of, uh, of, of, a, of a hobby, uh, a, cro a craft item. Maybe it's something you build like a, a model airplane or a, or a puzzle or something. There is no, there's no beauty in displaying the pieces all on their own in isolation. You know, you know, you don't buy that and put that box with all the loose pieces up on a, on, a, on a shelf. You build the thing. You put it together, all the pieces together. That is, that's where the beauty, that's where the purpose lies in. And so it is with you and I. And so I want to encourage you, although it's difficult, although it is different, to contend for this reality that Jesus is still doing. He's still building his church. He's still taking you and I as living stones. And he wants to have us together to count for him. And let me just be really honest with you, friends. You know, we just had our corporate prayer meeting. And I have to be honest with you, I would have loved to see, to, to have seen many more faces, more city gators over there. And I don't know what's going on. You know, I think that more than ever before, the bar is super low. Like for you to come to a gathering, uh, uh, you don't even have to get dressed technically. You don't have to leave your house. And so it's actually e more easy than ever before, easier than ever before. Um, and so I, I'm struggling to, to understand why I see so few of you there, but I want to in exhort you, want to encourage you. You are a living stone. We depend upon you. We depend upon you as a Christ follower, as a brick in the wall of the temple that Jesus is building. Please don't remove yourself. You are compromising the structural integrity of this local church. I would love to see you there in our community groups, whatever we do and in whichever format and way that we do it. Uh, we are allowed to do it, to come together. Would you be that stone? Would you be that living stone? Oh, it's, we've got to fight for this, friends. We've got to contend for it. And so, um, yeah, that's, that's the, the temple story. Um, and, you know, it's amazing because he's saying, yeah, that, you know, you're, you're priests. Yeah, you, you make the sacrifices. You are the temple. It's like a package deal, like this, 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 this picture of us of us, us being the temple and the activities that's often involved in the temple and the people that are often involved in the temple. It's all mashed up and thrown together right now. You know, those who don't follow Jesus can look at, look at, at Christians and can still separate some of those things. Oh, you have a building, you know, that's your sanctuary, that's your temple. And then you have the priests, you know, sometimes people call me a priest, even though I'm not, I'm a, technically an elder, I'm a pastor. Um, and so, you know, they're the guys who, who hear from God and, and, and who, who speak to God on behalf of the people. And, you know, the people are the ones who kind of, you know, show up and, you know, serve here and make the sacrifices. And, and actually, that's like very bureaucratic. That's actually not the way Jesus is building his church. He's saying, no, you're, it's all, all thrown together. You are a people that is a temple. Uh, you are the priests. You can connect to God through what Christ has done directly. You don't need to depend on someone else. Uh, and you are also the living sacrifices and your works and your service that you do. Uh, you, 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 you do those too. Others don't do it, you know, on your behalf. You, you do it. Uh, and um, of course, he's saying the cornerstone and the foundation is Jesus. And so even if you're not a Christian here and you think, okay, that's what it means. You do stuff for God. No, no, no. Whatever you do, if it's not upon Jesus, if it's not through Jesus, as it says here, it's not acceptable to God. It will not stand in the end. Whatever you do apart from Christ will not stand. And so all of us as Christ followers, we, we, we admit that He is the cornerstone. He is the foundation. And a cornerstone, you know, provides the angles. It provides the, you know, it gives, it gives the blueprint of the rest of the building. We get that from Jesus. It's a built upon Jesus. It's all because of Jesus. Um, nothing we do is apart from Him because anything we do apart from Him will not stand. So anyway, I trust that you would want to be a part of that temple story. And if you are a Christian, uh, let's contend for this reality that we are living stones together. And then the third story is actually, you know, zoom out a little bit, is Israel's story, the nation of Israel. 
And when Peter uh, writes to them here, he quotes from Acts chapter 19, verses 5 to 6. Uh, you, I'm sorry, Acts, Exodus, Exodus 19 in the Old Testament. You know, the, uh, Israel had just been rescued out of slavery from Egypt. And, and so God speaks these words over them, you know, that, that, that sounds like that, a chosen race, a, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people that's his possession. These are all words that are found in Exodus 19. And, and to the nation of Israel, they were a very important statements. It was like the we are statements. I don't know if you uh, watched the service right from the start, but in the beginning, as city gators, we say, who are we? And we've got these statements that say, we are the hospitable family of Jesus. We, you know, we are Holy Spirit empowered servants like Jesus. Like this is our identity, this is our, this is our DNA. Their DNA, their identity were found in those words. And here, Peter throws open those words even wider than the nation of Israel. And he's saying any follower of Jesus, actually, this applies to. If you're a follower of Jesus, you are now a chosen people, a God's precious possessions. And, and, and you can see why Peter and his friends were persecuted to the extent because, uh, you know, the, the, the nation, the Jewish nation were very proud of the fact that, that, that they were chosen by God. They didn't want to share that. And here Peter and the disciples now come uh, and, and say, no, this is now for everybody. And so, of course, the uh, persecution resulted. Um, but, you know, Peter is not saying that the church, this, this, this new temple is replacing Israel. Not at all. He's saying that the story that God began through the nation of Israel carries on. And actually Israel or, or Jews can step out of that story if they reject Jesus, they re reject the cornerstone. And Gentiles like you and me, non-Jews, can step into that story if we accept Jesus as the Messiah. And as we accept him as the Messiah, as the cornerstone, those words spoken over Israel are now spoken over you and me. It's now true for us as well, for everyone. It's an amazing thing. And so he goes on by, you know, using these terms. Let me explain them a little bit. Uh, you know, uh, Israel was a chosen race, you know, and he says, you now as a Gentile believing in Jesus, you're a chosen race too. You are a holy nation. And these are powerful realities. Uh, you know, a holy nation, a chosen race, but it means our primary identity is now that of being a Christian. And our secondary identities, like our ethnicity or where we come from, our race, that, that comes, comes second now. The primary thing is that we're Christians. We are citizens of heaven first. It's amazing because people, now people, Peter is writing to people here in their own home countries, in their home lands, in their hometowns, and he's saying to them, if you're a Jesus follower, if you're a Christian, you are now an exile. You, you are now a foreigner in your own homeland. This is the, the, the powerful thing that happens when you put your faith in Jesus and God becomes your father. You are now a chosen race, a holy nation. And I think even in our racially, racially charged world that we live in, where there's lots of tension, tension right now, I can see how the gospel can actually bring ethnicities together with this reality, this truth that actually that is secondary and, and Jesus in, and, and his kingdom is pri primary. Actually, we, we realize that Jesus therefore brings all ethnicities and all races together under one name, under, under one, in one kingdom. And, and therefore, we can actually advocate, I think, for racial justice more. We have a premise that I think is stronger than what the world has. And, and we don't fall into the trap even of elevating our race or our ethnicity over another one. Um, because actually, uh, you know, we, we don't put it in the place that it, not, it should not be. Um, and we're quite happy to, to stand for and, and, and advocate for justice uh, uh, when it comes to, to other ethnicities and other races and other nations, other contexts. And so I, I think it's a powerful statement about who we are as Christians. And um, it, it goes on to say that you're a royal priesthood, not just a chosen race, but also a royal priesthood. What does that mean? Well, priests, uh, you know, have kind of three jobs in the Old Testament. They, they minister to God, they are ministered to uh, by God, and they minister to others. So they kind of serve God. God, you know, blesses them and, and speaks and communicates, serves them, and then they serve other people. And often when priests serve other people, they provide an, a context and, a, and, a, and an opportunity for people to be serving God and God to serve them, ministering to God and God to minister to them. And so there's a sense that as priests, you, when you serve others, those are the other people you serve can seek and, and actually meet God, seek and meet God. 
And, and uh, that's why he says you, you're this amazing nation uh, called, out of, uh, uh, called to proclaim the excellencies of him who called us out of darkness into light. And so that's the job of a priest, actually, is to proclaim the excellencies of Jesus. And, uh, and, and we are therefore called to do what Israel wasn't doing. And remember, we said they persecuted Peter and his friends because, you know, they were opening up the, uh, and declaring that, that, that the blessings of Israel can now be the blessings for everyone because of Christ. And they, no, no, we can keep it to ourselves. And actually now as a royal priesthood, we can do what they failed to do. Even Jesus, when he quoted uh, from, from, uh, you know, from Psalm 118 uh, in Matthew 21 about the cornerstone you know, being rejected, he was saying the same thing to his listeners. They, he said, you know, you historically, you, you, you're better at fighting other people than inviting them in, better at keeping them away than bringing them closer. And uh, even now, I mean, you know what's happened in the news this, this, this last week with all the fighting that happens uh, at the Temple Mount in, in, um, in, uh, in Jerusalem. Um, I mean, this is, uh, this, is, this is the reality is that that is a byproduct of missing the real temple, missing the Messiah, missing Jesus. You, you can actually see that, that two ethnicities, um, two races are, are at enmity with each other. And... And Jesus actually came to abolish that and wants to open it up to all people, all nations. Um, and so we must not fall into that trap where we feel like, oh, this is just for me. This is just for us. And actually have that, uh, that, that, um, that openness, that willingness to share the gospel with any and everyone. Now, I mean, a sad story I can tell you um, uh, is that, you know, in my neighborhood a few years ago, I met a pastor, I met another minister. They had subsequently, you know, they've moved out of the area. But so one thing that, that really bothered me was, was uh, the, 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 their reference to so many immigrants and foreigners in the area and felt like they wanted to leave as a result of that. I just couldn't understand that. I mean, first of all, I'm an immigrant, you know, I'm a South African living in Canada. And one of the amazing things that I find of being called to Canada is actually that Canada does, specifically here in Ontario and the greater Toronto area, we see lots of other nations settling over here. And I find that an amazing thing, amazing opportunity for the gospel to be shared. Uh, and so let's be careful that we don't look at new people in and around our neighborhoods and look down our noses at them because actually then we're missing what he is saying over here um, and uh, missing what they called us to do. We are called to proclaim the excellencies of Jesus to others and to minister to others and to serve others with the gospel so that they may seek and meet God. That's the job of a royal priesthood of you and I. And so let's make sure that happens. And then lastly, he says, you're a special possession. And the word used there is, you know, of, of, a, of a private collection uh, that an ancient king may have, you know, just private uh, treasure collection they have. Like, uh, uh, and, and that speaks of the value you have and, and how God sees you. You're his treasured possession. Uh, God delights in you. God loves you. And, and maybe you find your worth from so many other things. Maybe it's your career. Maybe it's even your social media feed, how many likes and, and, and shares you, you get. Um, but I want to say you're not, you're not, not worth uh, any of those things. You are, you are, your worth is connected to what you are worth to God. And, and because Jesus it says he was rejected by men, but accepted by God and he's chosen and precious to God. And if you are in Christ, you are chosen and precious too. Just, just as you come to him, the living stone, so you too are living stones. As you come to him, the chosen and precious one, so you too are chosen and precious ones. This is an amazing and powerful truth. It says that, that in the sight of God, he's chosen, chosen and precious. And that means that God sees you. Maybe you feel like no one notices you. No one knows what you're going through. But this verse says that you are in the sight of God. God sees you. And that is an incredible truth. I, I thought about it the other day. We were watching a movie called The Aeronauts, I think. And if you're afraid of heights, don't watch it. It's not going to be fun. But it's about, you know, this, this breakthroughs, you know, um, scientific breakthroughs in a, in a hot air balloon uh, at the turn of the century. And um, as they were going up higher, you know, one of the comments they made was that people get smaller and smaller and buildings get smaller and smaller. And eventually you just realize how insignificant you and I are uh, when the higher we go. 
And arguably, I think God is, you know, is the highest being, of course, in the, in the whole universe. And so, you know, we are just dust, <laughs> not even, uh, you know, from his perspective. And yet it says that he sees us. Yes, it says that he sees you and me. And that's why he's saying over here that you can be rejected by men and actually stand because you are chosen by God. I find that so moving that God sees you, that he notices you, that you are a special possession to him, elected by him, but at the same time rejected. You know, you, you are chosen by him, but you're an exile. Uh, and and what, what causes you to cope with being an exile, what causes you to cope with rejection uh, by men is the fact that you're accepted by God. And acceptance by God happens through Jesus. And that's why he says in verse 6, whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. You know, no matter what the world throws at you, what levels of rejection you may receive as a, as a result of being a Christ follower, you will not be moved. You will stand strong if you know that you're accepted by God. Then you can be rejected by men. That's a powerful truth that you are a special treasured possession and you are in God's sights. He sees you. And you know, when, when people reject us for being Christ followers, they're not really rejecting you and me. They're rejecting Jesus. And that's the last story here. What is your story? Your own story? Where are you at with Jesus? Verse 8 says, you know, he's a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. And, and that people stumble because they disobey the word as they were destined to do. And I don't want you to trip over that as they were destined to do. All I want to say to you, listen, um, that there's man's responsibility. It says they disobey the word. And there's God's sovereignty about destination, you know, and, and, and as, as people were destined to do. And the Bible's very comfortable always having these two truths in tension, that God is sovereign, that he works out all of history the way that he wants it to happen. Um, but at the same time, you and I are responsible for our decisions. We, we obey or we disobey. And, uh, and before you today, there is an opportunity to obey or to disobey and not to say, oh, well, you know, I don't know if I'm destined either way. That is not up to you. That's up to God. But if you can obey now, I mean, the answer of whether you're destined to or not is, is, is found in your actions. This is all I can say to you is that, come on, you know, you're hearing the truth right now. Obey it. Because here's the thing. Everyone can come to the cross. Everyone can come to the stone, this cornerstone, um, but you have two options. You can either obviously be built on it or you can trip over it. Uh, you can come to the cross, but you have to then go through the cross. And that means denying yourself. That means dying to self, dying to sin. Yes, the cross is available to anybody. Anybody can come, but you have to go through it. Even as this verse says that, that as living sacrifices, you and I, our, 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 our lives are acceptable to God through Christ. You have to go through the cross. You have to come to terms with the stone. And Peter, when he quoted this passage, he, um, when he was preaching to the re religious rulers about Jesus being the cornerstone in Acts chapter 4, he did say there's no other name. He talked about the exclusivity of Jesus, that it is only through him, through him alone, that uh, salvation is found. And in, in Matthew 21, Jesus, he quoted this cornerstone verse again, and he was referring again to Israel rejecting him as the Messiah. He, he ends off that story with this. Let me read this, Matthew 21, verse 44. He says this, Jesus, and, and Jesus said, we should pay attention. He says, and the one who falls on the stone will be broken to pieces. And when it falls on anyone, it will crush him. And that sounds like, oh, that's, that's, that doesn't sound like there's hope for anybody. Well, let me see if I can help you help make sense of this. There is essentially only two options available for anybody, especially those who are listening right now. Either you will be broken as you fall on the stone. You're broken to pieces. That speaks of humility. That's, that means coming to the cross, but also going through the cross, say, following Jesus, denying yourself. It, it, you'll be broken as you fall upon him. Or you are crushed in judgment. That's going to come. Because the Bible tells us Jesus was crushed on that cross for you and me. As our sin came upon him. As he died in our place. And if you reject Jesus, you are basically saying, that's fine. I will bear the weight of my sin myself. And my friends, the outcome is that you will be crushed. You will be crushed. If you reject what Jesus did for you, you would have to pay for your sin yourself. 
And so that's the thing. When you come to the stone, either you will fall upon him in humility and be broken to pieces, admit that you're a sinner and you need a savior, or the stone will fall upon you and you will be crushed. Those are the two options. There's either acceptance by God and rejection by men, which is, you know, if you know you're God's chosen one, you can cope with the rejection. Or you are so afraid of what people might think of being a Christian that you choose acceptance of men, but then might result in the rejection of God. And I want to say to you today, anybody can come to the stone. This cornerstone is offered to anyone. Anyone can come to the cross. But the question is, will you go through the cross? Will you go through it? Will, will you fall upon this stone? Will you, in a sense, build your life upon the stone? Even though you, you come humbly, you're broken, so that God can put you back together and, and chisel you and shape you into a living stone that he uses to build his church? Or will you stumble over the stone and ultimately be crushed under the weight of, of, uh, of the sin that you said you would bear and you wouldn't uh, take Jesus' offer to bear it on your behalf. And I want to take you know, this moment into communion. So I'm going I'm to be back just with some communion instructions, okay? So you don't have to get your stuff ready, but yeah, give, me a, give me a moment to gather my thoughts. Okay, so I'm not too sure if your community group uh, is doing communion now. Maybe they, you know, pressing pause on this video and you're doing communion or, or uh, maybe it's happening after the service. Either way, uh, when we do communion together as living stones together, you know, understanding that we are the temple, that uh, you do this with, do it with these two things in mind. Number one, that you remember that Jesus was crushed for you, you know, as you come to the blood uh, the, the juice that represents the blood and the bread that represents his body. This is, these are images of Jesus being crushed on that cross to, because of your sin, so that you wouldn't be crushed. And then as you, as you remember that, remember that this is so that you could be built upon him. Broken, yeah, you come, you, you're broken by what he's done for you. You're humbled by it, yes. But you're not just broken, you're also built, therefore, on him as broken stones, really chiseled stones shaped by him, by his hands uh, and placed into the temple, his church, his people, his body. Would you celebrate those two things together as a community group? Uh, otherwise, we will see you uh, in groups during the week or um, Sunday online. But I'm gonna hand over to Brian now for our moment of commission. Hey, I'm Brian, one of the leaders here at City Gates. Um, we just talked through 1 Peter 2 about a stumbling block, and it made me think of a story uh, from my life. I went for a walk one time at a family reunion with my aunt, my grandma, and my great-grandpa. Uh, and surprisingly, he was a tall guy. I know I didn't get his height. Uh, but on this walk, he actually stumbled over a rock, and he fell, and he was over six feet tall, so it was a long fall, and obviously he was much older. Uh, he ended up being fine, but for the rest of the walk, the rest of us, we were just scanning the ground very carefully, watching for anything that anybody might trip over, not just for him, but for ourselves as well, just wanted to make sure that the route was, was safe. Whereas before that moment, we were just kind of, you know, casually walking and chatting away or whatever. Um, and yeah, it just kind of made me think about how with services, the way we're doing them now online, it can be really easy to be distracted, really easy to even be staring at the screen, but your mind is somewhere completely different. You're thinking about the chores you have to do this afternoon, or you're thinking about this TV show you've been watching or anything like that. It can just be easy for things to just kind of go in one ear and out the other. And so I just kind of want to challenge you. Maybe from this message, you did hear something that you stumbled over. Um, and I just want to encourage you to not continue the way you were going, but to let that change your walk, so to speak, to let that change the way that you're going so that now you're looking much more carefully, you're examining much more carefully your walk uh, of where you're going. But maybe you watch that message and you're just sort of waking up now and being like, oh, this is the end part, right? Uh, well, at least I watched it. I would encourage you to go back and watch it again. If you glazed over, if you got distracted, doesn't have to be right now, maybe a little bit later today or tomorrow. 
go back and watch it again or even just listen to the podcast and really spend the time to find something to stumble over. Find something that challenges you so that going forward, your walk changes. Uh, if you obviously were stumbling over something in this message, of course, the, um, the chat is open if you're watching this live, but we also have our community groups that mid meet midweek. Um, so be sure to check those out if you're not part of one, and that's a great place for discussions about things that we stumble over on Sunday mornings or even in our personal devotional times. So um, why don't you just let me pray for you? God, we thank you so much that you love us as we are. You love us as we are broken. But God, we also thank you that you love us enough to not leave us in our brokenness, but to call us into new life. Um, so God, we just pray that if you have caused us to stumble in this service, God, if you have said something uh, through the message or through the worship um, that has caught our attention, God, won't you just continue to work on us through that? Um, and God, I just pray that you would just continue to change our walks, God, that we would um, use our stumbling blocks, so to speak, uh, of things that stood out to us to change and to cause us to re-examine as we're going. And God, I just pray for life in our community groups as we're continuing to kind of mix things up. God, won't you just help us to have healthy discussions um, so that you can continue to work on us uh, as the potter molds the clay. So God, we thank you for everything that you're doing. We ask these things in your name. Amen. Well, thanks for joining us for City Gates at Home. Uh, hope you enjoy the rest of your week, and we'll see you next time.